Um, OK, so how do we actually get to decentralizing social media? What does that look like? Um, well, before we go to decentralizing social media, um, it's actually good to look at what's happening with money and how money is decentralizing today. Um, so a, a few years ago, maybe uh, you know, 15 years ago, um, Essentially, our money was controlled by centralized entities named banks, right? So we would have to put our money into a bank, uh, and whenever we want to send money to someone else or access our money, we have to go to that centralized institution, and they have to uh, help us do that. Um, with Bitcoin and then Ethereum and all the other blockchains that came out, money moved from being something on a centralized platform to something being on an open and decentralized platform. Uh, and those, those two words, open and decentralized, are really, really important. Um, so when money became part of an open platform, namely a blockchain, it allowed anybody to build on it uh, and to compare those applications with each other. Uh, so from money becoming open, you got Uniswap, Compound, Aave, OpenSea that couldn't be built in the closed system that was run by banks in the past. Uh, and decentralized means that nobody can take your money away from you. It's what's called censorship resistant, resistant to censorship. And what's interesting about this diagram is if we look at decentralizing money, there's actually a direct analog to how we think social media is going to decentralize. Um, so this is, looks like the same diagram, but it's actually with content um, instead of with money, right? So today, social media companies are kind of like banks, uh, but instead of having money in them, they have our content. And in the same way that we used to have to go to banks in order to send money to other people, today we have to go to social media companies in order to have content that gets seen by others or to see the content that other people are posting. And what we think is going to happen with very high likelihood, and I'm going to talk about it, is that content is going to move from being controlled by centralized entities, namely the social media companies, to being stored on a blockchain, namely on an open and decentralized platform. Right? Those two words are really important. Um, and that's going to have a lot of positive impacts on society that we're going to talk about. Um, but really, what we're talking about when we're talking about decentralizing social media is you're going to have a public-private key where you can create a profile. That profile will be stored on a blockchain rather than with a centralized company. You're going to be able to make posts, follow people, like things. All those, those things are going to happen on a blockchain that anybody can build their own feeds on top of. Um, and here you see a hint at some of the, the things that can be built off of content when it's open decentralized, but we'll get into that in a second. Um, so really, what we're talking about is uh, moving from the money layer, which is what Bitcoin and then Ethereum and Solana, all, all these other blockchains have given us, to a social layer, right? So today, we're you know, doing loans on Compound, we're all buying NFTs, but we interact on centralized platforms, right? We, we go back to Twitter, we go back to Discord. Uh, so really, content decentralizing is going to give us the social layer to complement the money layer that we have today. Um, and uh, to get a little more, now we're going to get more, a little more concrete. So why don't we have this social layer today? Why isn't content stored on a blockchain? Well. Obviously, you can say the existing incumbents like Meta have big network effects, and it's hard to build products that compete with those network effects. OK, we'll get to that. We're not even there yet, though. Uh, from a technical standpoint, it's very important to understand that decentralizing content is actually far more difficult than decentralizing money or decentralizing finance. Uh, and to understand that, it's very good to consider a very simple example uh, that is related to the cost to store the content. So if you and me want to do a financial transaction where I send money to you and you send it back, we can actually do that millions of times, and we won't generate any new data. All we'll really have to store on the blockchain is two account balances. We call those storage light or finite state applications. Uh, and I had a, a different uh, PowerPoint where it was on there, but finite state is what all of DeFi is today. It doesn't generate that much data when you interact with it, and that's why it can run, be run so cheaply on blockchains. If you look at something like a social app, or even a marketplace, or a lot of things in Web2, those, uh, uh, those kinds of applications generate data with every single interaction that a user has with an app. Every post generates a data that has to be stored and indexed potentially forever, but so does every like, every follow, every DM. What we, we need to move, uh, in order to be able to support social applications, those types of applications, uh, we need to have blockchains that can support not finite state applications, but actually what we call infinite state applications, where the amount of data that you need to store grows with every interaction that the user does. And that's actually what blockchains are really bad at today. Um, so if, uh, if you just uh, look at the concrete example here, uh, it's actually quite interesting, right? So, this might be a bit foreign to people because we never really do uh, things that require storage of data on the existing blockchains. But if you actually were to look at the cost of storing 200 characters on any of the existing smart contract blockchains, you'd see the prices are quite high. Um, so it's actually about $80 on Ethereum today, 
but the lowest uh, is Cardano at about 14 cents, which is just too high, right? Remember, we're competing with Web2 applications. So can you imagine building a social application where every post, every DM costs 15 cents? Obviously, that's going to be uh, difficult to compete with, with Web2. Um, and it's interesting because there actually are blockchains that have decided to attack this directly, namely Arweave and Filecoin. Um, but those actually have a different problem, which is they can't index content. So you not only, if you were to put all of your posts on a Filecoin or an Arweave, you, you wouldn't be able to answer basic questions like, show me all the posts from all of the people that I follow, or show me everything that everyone who's liked this post, or show me all of my DMs. Um, and in addition to that, uh, when, a, when a blockchain is focused on storage like Arweave or Filecoin, they don't support financial primitives. So you can't do NFTs, you can't do ERC-20s, you can't do a lot of the, the things that move money around on Filecoin or Arweave today. Uh, and instead, you have to combine two blockchains, like you have to combine a Solana with a Filecoin or something like that. Um, and so what we think is needed in order for content to really go on chain is a single blockchain that can kind of combine the cheap storage of an Arweave or a Filecoin with all the money stuff like NFTs, uh, 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 ERC-20s, and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so that's what we're working with on DSO. It's a layer one blockchain built to power what we call infinite state applications, really any Web2 application that requires a lot of storage backed by Sequoia, Andreessen, and, and uh, uh, Social Capital, Coinbase, and many others. Over 200 apps built on it, 1.8 million wallets. Um, if you guys have heard of BitCloud, that was actually one of the first apps that was built on the DSO blockchain. Um, and it's listed on Coinbase. Um, so with that, uh, I want to go into uh, some of the stuff that I was talking about of how do we actually get from uh, uh, today, where all the uh, activity is happening on a centralized platform, to where it's happening on a decentralized blockchain, whether it's the DSO blockchain that we work on or um, and this is where the anti-fragile word kind of comes in. So as soon as there's a single retentive application, an application that's sticky, that users come back to, uh, that has any kind of content being generated on chain, that actually creates an incentive for developers to build on that open and decentralized platform. Uh, why? Well, because when there's content stored on an open decentralized platform, there's no cold start problem for developers to build new and more innovative social applications on top. Uh, and so it's kind of a snowball that starts as soon as you have a single seed of retention uh, that, that occurs in the ecosystem. It, re it results in a virtuous cycle. Uh, you have one app that becomes popular. Uh, then you have more developers wanting to build off of that fire hose of content, which brings more killer apps, which brings more users of content uh, in a loop, um, which is very interesting. Um, and what does the end game look like? Well, remember, you're, you're solving the cold start problem, right? So a new app that forms doesn't have to acquire a billion users in order to be competitive. So they can actually focus on purely curating content. Um, so you'll probably start to see apps that focus on specific types of, of social content or content in general. Uh, for example, sports-focused feeds, politics-focused feeds. Um, there might actually be apps for each individual country, many different apps that are, where the curation is happening by people actually in that country, like people in India. China, uh, rather than Silicon Valley exporting its curation to the rest of the world, which is what happens today. Um, yeah, and you can have adult-focused apps, science-focused apps, focused apps, but again, all built off of a common fire hose, and you can have uh, your identity be portable across them, pseudonymous identity because it's all with public-private keys, um, and I think this is going to be more competition and innovation across the board, which is very exciting. This is a very unintuitive benefit. This goes back to why it's good to decentralize social media. Moderation is actually easier on an open and decentralized platform. OK, why is that? Well, when the content is open, you can actually have the top machine learning researchers in the world analyzing the fire hose of content, building better and better models uh, that actually um, uh, can label things much better than we can today, where there's just basically Facebook uh, and their uh, top-down team that's doing it where that team isn't really motivated to find the bad stuff, right? Um, and so you, ha you can have a comp competition start to emerge around labeling content for NSFW, whether it's factual or an opinion, or even just topics, right? Like what kind of content is it? What's the sentiment? Um, and then lastly, misinformation is actually easier and faster to detect, again, when it's spreading on an open platform versus when it's spreading on a closed platform. The entire world can be watching and analyzing, and someone who's a researcher at a university can write a blog post about these caches of misinformation that are spreading, why they're spreading, and we can have an open and transparent conversation about what to do about that, rather than, again, all of this happening in back rooms at private corporations who aren't even that motivated to stop it because they earn ad revenue off of it, of course. Um, cool. There's a lot of uh, uh, new monetization primitives that you get when you mix content with, uh, with crypto, uh, new business models based on microtransactions, uh, not attention, right, not on ads. Uh, there's already a lot of things you can try with social tokens. 
NFTs, DAOs, paid DMs are a really interesting space that gets opened up by this, crypto tipping. Uh, and all of this comes, uh, exists in applications on the DSO blockchain today, which is really cool. And obviously, we'll start to emerge on, on uh, if other blockchains emerge as well. Um, cool. And I think just generally speaking, you can combine kind of speculation and money uh, with content in interesting ways. Uh, we saw that with BitCloud, but there are many other examples at this point. Um, Cool. And so in terms of creating that retentive seed uh, of, of users and content that's required in order to get that kind of anti-fragile uh, virtuous cycle going, there are many ways to look at it. You can obviously launch a standalone app. Uh, an interesting thing is today, uh, everyone who's in crypto, who, who works on DeFi and works on things like that, um, is still engaging on Twitter, Discord, and, and Facebook Messenger these kinds of places. Uh, but it's very interesting. You know, there's not really any reason, other than it being expensive, why someone wouldn't want a messenger, for example, attached to MetaMask that is end-to-end -end encrypted and on-chain, uh, and end-to-end uh, -end encrypted on-chain for DMs, on-chain for group chats. And there's actually a really big benefit, which is that all the users on traditional, I say traditional crypto platforms, but let's call them like the NFT platforms, for example, like OpenSea, Rarible, uh, Foundation, right? Imagine if they could message each other where the, message, the social layer that those messages are going on is open and decentralized, right? Well, some really interesting things start to happen. You could have someone message a person on Rarible, and they'll get it no matter where in the ecosystem they are, even if they're on OpenSea, even if they're on Foundation, even if they're in a DeFi app like Compound, right? Um, and so I think another way, other than building a standalone app, that we can get a seed of retentive users and content um, is just to essentially piggyback on what social features people want in existing apps today that are enabled by, by MetaMask. And this brings me to a big announcement we have today, uh, which is DSO has uh, integrated with MetaMask. Um, and this is really interesting because uh, until now, wallets like MetaMask have been seen as things that move money around. But I think now that we have blockchains that are capable of actually storing and indexing content like DSO, um, wallets as we know them today can actually start to become the keys to fighting Meta and fighting TikTok and fighting Twitter uh, by enabling social features as well. So this integration allows anyone with a MetaMask wallet to create a profile, make posts, follow people, as well as do all kinds of interesting uh, uh, monetization things with NFTs, ERC-20s, and really cool stuff like that that's actually tied to content. The second thing is we're launching DSO.com, uh, which you guys get a sneak preview of today. Uh, and you can actually claim your username on DSO.com, which is really cool. Um, and so just to leave you with a final thought, uh, you know, look, again, I think that decentralizing social media is going to have a strong positive impact on society for all the reasons I mentioned, more competition between apps, better apps, better monetization, uh, better moderation, um, but also that a single seed of users and content that is retained on any app that's built on a blockchain uh, is likely going to cause uh, uh, a lot of uh, other developers to want to build on that blockchain and for things to grow and grow. So if you want to check out Decentralized App today, check out diamondapp.com. And if you want to claim your username, you can go to disa.com. And that's the username and password there uh, for uh, mainnet folks to check out. Uh, thank you guys so much. And uh, th yeah, thanks for having me. All right. Thanks.